Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Lindsay Sullivan, and I am the Education Manager for the National Demolition Association and your moderator for today's presentation. To welcome you to today's webinar, Demolition Foundation's webinar series, Risk Management. Parker. We do encourage you to submit questions during the presentation. You can do so by selecting the questions tab on your control panel, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Simply type a question and hit send. As time permits, we will answer questions from the audience at the end of the presentation. All will be able to see the submitted questions in the Q&A tab as other attendees submit them. If you like a question and really want to see it answered, click the thumbs up next to the question. We'll start asking the most popular questions when it's time for the And now I'd like to introduce Chris Kovac, NDA president, to say a few words. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Godek. I'm the current president of the National Demolition Association. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for taking the time to invest in your, yourselves through education today. The National Demolition uh, Education offerings are best in class. Our classes are taught by demolition professionals, professionals that are not only facilitators and educators, but are uniquely positioned to use real life business experiences to help educate our students. This is our first online training of its kind. It was brought about due to the current pandemic and a desire to make training available to our members who are working remotely, remotely or are currently laid off. This is the first of three installments, and I hope you are able to join us in the future for additional episodes. The National Demolition Association, or the NDA, is here to help provide information to our membership. I am hopeful that you have found our, member, our, our information that we have that we have put out regarding our nation's current situation has been thorough enough to help, but clean enough to not inundate you with a lot of information. If you need anything additional information wise or help and you are, or a, and you are a current member, and even if you are not a current member and you just need some help and you're, and you're you know, one of our peers in, in the demolition industry, please reach out to our offices. We have a fantastic team that is ready to help. Lastly, these times are taxing both mentally and physically, but together we will get through this. Please take the time to take care of yourselves and to remember to take care of others because caring is love and love always wins. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it back over to Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Chris. And now I'm going to flip it right over to today's NDA facilitator, Tim Barker. Welcome, Tim. Great. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank, thank you, Chris. Hey, we have uh, spent uh, many hours, myself and many leaders within the demolition industry, volunteering our time to really pour into you, our, our industry, our industry leaders. We have some, a number of, of uh, clients on this call today, also our owners of uh, different uh, various facilities in, in various industries. So we really appreciate you all joining us and taking some time today. I think you'll, you'll find um, uh, some, some valuable things in the course that we're going to be speaking to today. This is a really a, a kind of a uh, fast uh, pace presentation. So hold on to your seats. We're going to go through it rather quickly. What you're going to see today in 45 minutes, we usually spend a day. So we're going to touch off on a number of areas and others we're just going to fly right through. But we'll, we'll, I'll point them out as we pass them up so that if you want to uh, go deeper in any particular area of risk management, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, when At our company, whenever we have a meeting or a gathering, there's more than six people, we start that meeting with a safety moment. And so my safety moment today is one that I share with uh, just about every new client, every new contractor I get the opportunity to work with. And that is, uh, interestingly, 28 years ago, this week, in the same month, I had my uh, first and only fatality on my demolition project that I was managing. I was a project manager. And I said, if it was a big if, if I continue to be in this industry, that could never happen again. And uh, fortunately, a number of the things that I had learned to prevent a reoccurrence of that type uh, are the same things that also allow you to bring projects in on time, had a schedule under budget, and it's just a win-win all the way around. I often say that safety is synonymous with savings, and it, it truly is. And part of that is managing your risks. So with that, we're going to jump right into this uh, presentation. Um, what's in it for you? Obviously, a proactive role in getting out there in, in front of issues that you face and risk. And we're going to talk 
well beyond just the environmental safety and health risks that we typically think of. There might be some people on the call that have maybe an insurance background. What, when they think of risk management, they think of something else. There's an element of risk management in the financial sector. When they think of risk, they think of something else. If you're a contracts manager on the call today or an owner, you're thinking of risk in a different way. So we're gonna to try to cover all of the, the various ways that we manage risk and look at risk. And at the end of the day, you'll have an, uh, a greatly increased confidence in, in your project management ability. So program overview, here are the seven things we love to cover today. Again, some of these we will spend some time on, others we're just gonna to have to blow right by. But as you can see here, defining risk management, what is it uh, as it pertains to health, safety, environmental risk, we'll definitely touch off on that. Uh, then the difference between the technical and the commercial side of risk. So not only just the physical uh, safety risk on the project, but what kind of commercial risk are out there that we need to identify? Uh, playing on the offense as well as on the defense, rather than waiting for it to occur, what can we do up front to prevent it? Uh, we'll talk about reputational risks. Those are those public relation risks that we're all should be very sensitive to this uh, day and age. And then we're going to give you some risk management tools. You'll leave here today with uh, a few examples, a few things that you can use. And if we have time, we, we may talk a little bit about the risk management exercise. Unfortunately, today we don't have the ability to break you up into groups, which is what we do in the 40-hour course uh, a number of times, is we'll break you into various groups. We'll send you out to do the exercise and four or five, six people and you'll come back and you'll tell us what you've learned. And that's a very um, exciting thing. It's very interactive when you get to work with your peers and clients and, and different people in your industry on these, these various things. So defining risk management. What is risk management? So risk management is, is really the identification of risk. So you show up and you've got a project or you're looking at budgeting some money for a capital or a project or, or maybe it's your plan for next year. You identify what, what are those risks? And after you identify those risks, then you assess those risks. What are they high, medium, low? As you begin to analyze those risks, you understand um, or have a better understanding of what you may need to spend more time uh, addressing. And then that's when you develop your plan to address that risk. Um, when I say address the risk, sometimes you can reduce it, sometimes you can transfer it, sometimes you can control it. Other times you just have to live with it if, if, if you can. But it's risk that uh, at the end of the day, you determine that there's nothing you can do about it, but the risk is ultimately worth the reward, so you move forward. So how do, you, how do you do that? Well, three common areas of risk management, really the project risk, that's the technical side. When you get into the contract, the commercial risk, and the public and perception risk. So those are the biggies that we often deal with in demolition. Now, granted, there are others, and depending upon your background, you, you may want to speak a little more time on one uh, as compared to, a, to the other, but you can come back and join us in the, the full day class and we'll, we'll walk you through that. Three common risk ratings, and I always like to keep things very simple. As you saw in that first quote, the, the astronaut that, that obviously they, you know, spends a lot of time mitigating risk, he said he likes to break down all the systems to a one pager. So I, I do the same thing with most of the tools that I use. On one page, can I see, can I identify what the risks are on my project and, and then denote if they're low, medium, or high. If it's low, we could probably live with it. We're good to go. If it's medium, we may need to slow down. Medium, obviously, being that yellow light or green in this example. And then high, hey, if it's, if it's red and you see danger, uh, we need, that's time to stop. Let's stop. Let's take a look at it before we proceed forward. Doesn't mean we stop forever, but we do pause and see if we can mitigate that risk. So again, low, medium, high. There are risk assessment tools. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can spend some time uh, identifying if it's low, medium, high, low, green, green, medium, yellow, red, high, by looking at the severity and the probability. The severity is the, the it, it may, may be catastrophic if it does occur, but you look over on, at the probability and it's very improbable or unlikely that it may occur. So it might just be noted as a, as a yellow. Or in other situations, you might look at the severity of a risk and see that it's moderate. 
Um, but the uh, opportunity for it to occur is frequent. For example, if you're imploding a building, you know that you're going to generate dust. What, what risks are associated with that? Again, identifying uh, risk and then measuring if it's medium, high, or low. There's some additional tools that you can use that most, most companies and organizations use this to define severity and probability if you want to go deep. We don't have time to go to deep today, but you can come back to this. I think, uh, Lindsay, I think may be providing a copy of this to the participants today, and if not, you'll definitely get a copy of it if you join the one day uh, risk management course. So here's what a risk register looks like. So how do you capture this information? And how do you evaluate it? So number one, and I'll just look at some real life examples here. These examples are uh, from a, a number of different projects as I put them all together to come up with uh, scenarios. And the first risk is we worked in situations before where we're explosively felling a boiler or a stack or a structure, and we know it's going to create some vibration. There's going to be some seismic issues to deal with when it hits the ground. And oftentimes they're, that, that structure may be near uh, some very sensitive electrical or communication, other type of, of equipment that's, that's, that can be impacted. Um, as a result of vibration. So in those scenarios, when you're right next to, and I had one, for example, was a project that was only 50 feet away from an operating facility. And I came in, said, yeah, I think uh, I agree with the contractor. The best way to bring down those, hundred, those 220 foot tall structures is with explosives. And the owner just looked at me as, as if I was crazy because I was backing up the contractor saying, yes, that is the, that I believe is the safest way, it's the lowest risk, and their, but their concern there was their operating facility. Well, long story short, we looked at ways to mitigate that risk. The structures came down and uh, there were no issues. And so again, that started off being a red. It continued to be a red, but it didn't mean that we ignored it because there wasn't much we could do to bring down the risk. It just meant as a red, we're gonna spend more time focusing on that risk, whereas uh, a yellow or a green will spend less. But here again, in the example, number two there, we have scope increases resulting from a, <laughs> maybe things, uh, asbestos or PCB paint or building materials that wasn't captured on the hazardous materials assessment or the regulated materials assessment, whatever you call it. And uh, anybody on this call that's, that's done a few demolition projects or abatement projects know that that's, that's, a, uh, that's a reality, that that often happens. So we identify that. And up front, maybe it's just a matter of of setting aside some budget or contingency or as a contractor, if you're bidding fixed firm price lump sum, maybe you need to um, provide an exclusion, exception, or quantify uh, the, the material that you're bidding. Again, you're identifying that risk. I just brought up something that maybe some of you noticed. The use of a risk register shouldn't just be when the project starts. It should be well before the project starts, maybe in the, the bidding phase, maybe the, the, the planning, the the, the study phase when you're out looking at projects. The key is, is unlike, a, unlike an action item list, a risk register is a living document. It's not something you just go to, you check off the box and then move on. It's something that you add to over the course of a project and you sit down on a regular basis. Maybe it's monthly, quarterly, maybe it's even weekly if it's a very uh, dynamic project. And the key is to get the right people involved in sitting down and evaluating those risks. And we'll continue, we'll come back to this. So in defining risk management, there's two important concepts that have to be discussed. One's a hazard, one's a risk. These are not the same thing. The hazards, obviously, stop work immediately. Hey, it's a hazard. Uh, it's a, it immediately dangerous to life or health, or maybe there's an issue. See something, say something. That's different than looking at a risk, which may be something that you can evaluate as your team. Again, maybe it's a yellow risk that you can bring down to green by making a, a few changes or a red that you can bring to yellow. Very rarely are you able to take that high level of red risk and bring it right down to green. But sometimes you can. Sometimes you start the project and you evaluate something as a green risk and ultimately it comes up and becomes a greater risk. Can we get rid of all risks? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> risk management is just that. It's managing risk. It's mitigating. So your plan is taking steps to reduce the adverse effects of risk. You can't always eliminate risk. It's not always a possibility. Risk taking can also be exciting, profitable. Now it should be, but it just shouldn't be dangerous. So educated guys. When you ID hazards, things that are dangerous that can harm people, stop. That's not the time. And there shouldn't be an acceptable level of risk if you're in a situation where people are in harm's way. 
good project managers are really best to find someone that, that can manage risk, project risk, contract risk, and, and public relations. What are some other risk categories? Well, if you were in the class <laughs> today, you could provide those, but actually right now, you can send Lindsay a list of some of the other risk categories that you'd like to talk about, um, and we can discuss them towards the end. Health, we've talked about the health and safety environmental risk, identifying the risk. Here's an example of risk. Everybody likes the implosion, but nobody likes, you know, a piece of rock flying by the walls. Unfortunately, there has been some situations where people have been injured as a result of the implosion. Now, fortunately, in, in, in the United States, we haven't had a fatality as a result of, of explosively felling a boulder or, or implode, imploding a structure. Uh, but again, there's clearly some risk. What, what risks are involved in imploding a building? Well, environmental risk. If you have been watching the news this last year, you may have seen the stack that came down. We did a lot of dust recently in the Chicago area. And from what I've heard, all the neighbors are up in arms and they're getting ready to all, you know, as, as I had one client say, uh, meet with the uh, owner for a shakedown. <laughs> and so everyone's got their hands out and they're and if, we, if you haven't managed that environmental risk, if there is no air sampling data, if you don't have any uh, asbestos surveys or clearance samples of, that the asbestos has been removed from the structure or at least evaluated, and I can go on and on and on, <clears throat> you could be looking at a substantial uh, impact uh, from those environmental risks. Permits. Uh, we, we had a situation where there was some fine print in a permit that required a notification at a certain point in the project that I was unaware of. It was completely foreign to me. 30 years, had never even thought about it, that a city would have a special permit requirement just for a specific activity. My miss. Um, so again, there's some risk associated with permits. You're looking at a project, you might not be able to define what all the permit requirements are. So you need to understand what those risks are. And the regulators get involved. Waste, clearly there's huge risk associated with waste. When you're looking at a project, when you're looking at characterizing what's there, where it's going to go, what can be recycled, what can be reused, how it can be reused on site. And the list goes on and on and on. And again, if you can join us for the full one day, we'll give you uh, examples of all of these, dozens of examples for each one of these areas that you can consider water. Water is a huge risk. Uh, more than just the wastewater, or excuse me, stormwater prevention pollution plan, uh, but there's other things to consider. We've had situations uh, not too long ago where we've had water in contact with the demolition uh, material and it has contaminated the water and then what to do with it. If you're on an industrial site where there's an NPDES permit and they're monitoring the outfalls, you have a tremendous amount of risk if something goes through that outfall is not um, allowed to in the permit. Again, join us for the full day and we'll give you a list of these items. Commercial risk. Um, hopefully I have a few contract managers or estimators on the project and I'll appreciate this, this section. Uh, when you're looking at a project, you're looking at the contract risk, insurance, scheduling, uh, market risk, con uh, subcontractor vetting risk. Or, this is well before the project begins. And you only get a chance to do some of these things one time. You, once you sign off on the T's and C's, it's over. So understanding what those contract risks are. Maybe as the owner, making sure you have the right contract terms for the project that you're, you're managing. Uh, the insurance risk. Uh, if you're imploding a 33-story uh, building in a downtown area that's got very close neighbors, maybe you need more than $2 million of insurance. Or maybe you're in an industrial facility where you're right next to some operating lines that could be impacted and the contractor is going to be performing some, some high-risk activities. Maybe you need to uh, to, to look at that insurance or look at other things that you can do to mitigate those risks before proceeding. Um, scheduling risk, numerous scheduling risks we could talk about. And again, if you join us, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the critical path and predecessor set, uh, successor relationships and all the risk associated with, with scheduling, not only your work, but the work that is completed before you begin and, and sometimes the work that's, that, that begins right after you complete and how you could be contractually responsible uh, tied into those uh, scheduling risks. Market risk, a number of factors to consider there. We'll look at some of those marketing risks and subcontract vetting here in the next couple of slides. So uh, I know we have a, a number of contractors as well as clients and owners on this call, but owners, there is this idea there used to be, it's out the window now, thankfully, but it was, hey, we, we hired the experts, we got insurance, and it's a basically a see, hear, speak, no evil. 
Well, that doesn't work. Uh, when somebody gets hurt, unfortunately, or there's an issue, uh, those attorneys that represent those plaintiffs are going after their pockets. And that's the owners. And unfortunately, uh, most recently, we've been taking down a lot of power plants over the last decade. And in the U.S. and similarly managed U.K., there's been 12 fatalities. And I hate to bring up fatalities, but the reality is it, we're in a dangerous business. And so these things have to be considered. Uh, five uh, in, in 50 day period in 2018, which was incredible. Keep in mind, most of these incidents are best in class contractors. These are not just uh, low bid awards to somebody that hasn't been properly uh, vetted. So, with that, um, understanding that there's a, as many as a dozen uh, potential fatalities or demolition related each year, what can we do uh, to, to mitigate that, that risk? Again, the OSHA citations are to the contractors, but recently public utility commissions have fined even the utilities, the owners, the key words there, for lack of oversight for vetting. I'm, in pro I'm involved in a big project internationally right now. And I was reading some history of some of the challenges this nation has faced in the demolition sector. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I was reading some uh, legal information. And these were the two key words that came up, uh, lack of oversight and vetting that, that allowed the, the, the plaintiff attorney to go beyond the contractor to the owner, to the owner's engineer, to other parties that were involved in the project. So, and if you're cited, there's a violation, obviously plaintiff attorneys are gonna jump all over that. Owners just simply cannot con contract away these risks. So for you contractors, if you wonder why owners are so in your business at times, uh, this is what. So what if, but, but what do we do as owners? or if you're representing an owner. Well, OSHA, you know, may if you get too involved, or they may give you a multi-employer citation for controlling or correcting the, the contractors. You know, you just pick up some liability. Again, with that, that knowledge, the plaintiff's attorney, they're going to build their case for their clients. So see the deep pockets at the end of the day. So, so what do we do as an owner or as a general contractor, or maybe you're as the demo contractor with demo subcontractors? What do we do? Well, there's a good defense. Obviously, we can, we can make sure that we have strong T's and C's. We can make sure our contracts have termination for convenience and default clauses and liquidated damages, consequential damages. Hopefully, many of you have force majeure in your contracts because that was very applicable in the last couple of months with COVID-19 and hold harmless, limited waiver uh, as part of your indemnity language in your insurance. There's many good defensive approaches, but I've found as good as all the defensive approaches are, uh, that are available, the best thing is to be on the offense. And so even from the beginning, as you look at how you're going to award the uh, project or, or as a contractor, what projects you're going to pursue, you're looking at, again, risk. If it's just straight low bid uh, project and they're not looking at the qualifications of the companies, that's a high risk project. You, you know, uh, for those of us who've been in the industry for any amount of time, we know the, the oftentimes the contractors that win those projects they know the uh, they know the industry and they know the contract terms uh, way better than most of the clients that they work for. So their objective is just to get their foot in the door, and it's just going to be a mess. It's going to be change orders, and there's going to be challenges from the word go. But again, some people can do well in that 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 market. Others lowest take use or pursued lowest qualified bid. Now this reduces the risk. You have a pool of maybe good subcontractors or as an owners, good demo contractors that you use, you've, you've reduced some of your risk. You're, you're not inviting 12 companies to show up to bid your projects. You've reduced it down to maybe four or six. And then there's the best value. You're, you're going deeper than just price. This is where I like to operate. We're looking um, well beyond just the numbers. Not in, in, <laughs> The reality is um, the low bid is often the, at the end of the project, the, the, the highest cost. That's the reality. Again, for those of us who've been in the business, we realize that. So using that best value approach where you pay a little more up front, well, what you're doing is you're mitigating some risk. You know, over the, the duration uh, of the project, ultimately you're going to get a better outcome, a better prod, product from your subcontractor or your contractor. And again, we could talk about the pros and cons for all these. So how do you mitigate some of those risks when you're an owner or a contractor working with a subcontractor? Well, I know many of you have are familiar with and have used the VETA, all the different types of vetting tools. Our company has a has one, but that's okay for 
for, uh, I would say, average size projects. Once you get over three or four stories, our process or my process for vetting a contractors and helping owners vet contractors or my subcontractors when I uh, used to be a demolition contractor was a lot greater. I'd ask a lot more information. And then if I'm working on a multi-million dollar, maybe a 50 million or $30 million project, 100,000 tons, then I'm obviously going to go a lot more deeper. And what you're looking at here is actually my worksheet, but you're only looking at page one of, of three um, for those, those massive projects. You're looking at all of it for those smaller projects. But again, it's very similar to the same things that you have to fill out for your Fortune 500 companies and IS Net World and Bronze and those types of things. Your EMR last three years, total recordable incident rate, uh, your insurance, so on and so forth. So again, that's how you can mitigate some of that at risk by getting that information, making sure that you have a good contractor and the right contractor for the scope of work that uh, you're performing or subbing to your subcontractor. Clearly, not all market risks um, are avoidable. Uh, unfortunately, we all know that by looking at the market uh, this last 30, 60 days, but also the scrap market. It's directly tied to the to the Dow, oftentimes. It's been going up other, other commodities, but this is a volatile market. We have really no control over the scrap market. As you can see there, in 2008, it was, it was great. If you were sitting on a project at $500 a gross ton for scrap, life was wonderful. wonderful. But a year or two later, you couldn't give away that same scrap for $100 a gross ton. So again, it's a very volatile market. So how do you manage or mitigate that risk? Again, if you join us for the full day, we'll, we'll give you some examples. But I'm just going to touch off on this time. Reputational risk are very important, or this should be to all of us. Maybe you're a local uh, company or regional or even national, or maybe even a Fortune 500 company. You're very concerned about your brand, your name uh, in the industry, in the community. Maybe you're a small um, local community uh, company. Well, you're, we're all very concerned about our name, our reputation, because, again, we want to work with and for people that, 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 that know us, that, that know that we can provide quality services and not just a, a low bid. So with a reputational risk at the end of a, maybe uh, bringing down a boiler, obviously life could be good. The boiler came down, uh, things were great. Um, clearly you see some black dust there. I'm sure it's probably a result of some residual coal is in the powerhouse or in the boiler, which is it's kind of hard to remove before you take down a boiler. Um, but oftentimes, you could have some uh, negative uh, feedback from the community on the, um, the demolition. Sometimes this may occur before or even after the demolition project. So again, are you prepared for those, those risks? Are you, do you have a crisis management plan if something were to happen or, or go away? I, I will provide an example. Just one recently, our company had the contract to uh, build Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm at talking to you from today. And we were one of the joint ventures. Well, we also had the oversight contract uh, for the enclosure of the demolition of Georgia. And as I was talking to the uh, program director, uh, project director of the whole $1.6 billion project, I asked him, who's going to talk to the press if something uh, doesn't go as planned? And he said, well, the contract. And I said, well, are you interested in having me maybe write up a number of, of, of narratives um, if it doesn't go as planned. And boy, I immediately got his attention. <laughs> and I said, more likely it won't. You've got a great demo contractor. You've got a great uh, blaster. Uh, but the reality is there are things that happen uh, when you bring in several thousand pounds and 3,400 charges into a structure that you can't um, always uh, completely manage or mitigate. So you need a crisis management plan and uh, provided a, a number of narratives. And thankfully, he, he only needed to use number three and not number one on that list because uh, overall, everything turned out uh, fairly well. So again, what's your crisis management plan if things don't go as planned? The wrong time to develop that is, 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 is when you need it. Those are things that you need to have uh, well in advance in order to, to meet your risk. And then project closeout. You think, well, the job's over, we're, we're good to go. Well, not, not necessarily. <laughs> and I like to put it this way. Um, sometimes when you go with the low bid, you will uncover uh, figurative and literal uh, liabilities long after the project is over. 
Uh, they may show up in the form of surface depressions uh, because the contractor wasn't adequately backfilling, compacting, maybe capping underground utilities, or maybe they may show up offsite where materials were improperly uh, disposed of. But again, so again, as they say, uh, well, the work's not done until the paperwork's done. So as an owner, as a general contractor, as a demo contractor, you need to understand what your risks are as you're closing out the project, making sure that everything went where it was supposed to, making sure that you have the, the training certificates that you need for the asbestos workers, making sure that you have the, the manifest for the hazardous materials that went out uh, for the various materials that were generated during the project. I can tell you after <laughs> you provide that uh, final retainage payment, you're gonna have a hard time uh, getting that uh, invaluable information that you need to tuck away somewhere and have. I, to this day, um, have people will call me from 10, 15 years ago and want their uh, training certificate, their asbestos training certificate. By law, I need to find it and, and uh, provide that to them. So just keep that in mind. There's some things you're required to keep for 30 years and you need to have it as an owner or even a, a demolition general contractor where you have demo subs or abatement subs. I would strongly encourage you to keep a copy of that information. There's a tremendous amount of turnover in our industry. I sat on the board 25 years ago uh, with a number of, of great uh, folks, and I look at the, uh, the the top number one, two, and three demo contractors at that time, and it's completely changed today. So there's definitely a, a lot of movement in our industry. So just keep that. I'm bringing it all together here. I'm going to make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A as I wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. So one, we talked about a risk management plan, having a plan. Now we didn't get into the specifics, uh, but I'll touch off on some highlights right now. When I talk about a plan, the plan is how do you identify and assess and come up with a plan to mitigate that risk? And this is beyond just the risk register, which I showed you earlier. This is who's involved with that plan. What stages of the project are we going to develop a, a risk management plan? How are we going to sit down? Who's going to sit down? I am a huge proponent of making sure that we get our subject matter experts. If we have, if we're talking about site restoration, backfill and compaction, uh, then I want the civil engineer there or the, the person, the, the project manager, the site superintendent, superintendent that's involved in that activity. If we're talking about the asbestos abatement, I obviously want the abatement worker there or the environmental scientist that's, that's leading that. If we're talking about um, you know, taking structure down and we're coming up with a plan to mitigate the risk, then we want the, that demolition subject matter expert there, that structural engineer, and so on and so forth. Again, to develop a risk management plan, um, if you're talking about contract risk and you don't have your contract manager, or maybe in some cases reaching out to your to the attorney that you use or insurance company, I would always go first to your insurance company. That's what they get paid for. Um, uh, it's, it's just foolish to, to talk about um, coming up with a plan to mitigate risk without the right parties sitting at the table. So again, after you have your plan, then you develop that risk register. How do we capture the risk? And to succeed in anything, you need a plan. You've all heard it said, and it's true, if you hadn't written it down, it didn't and the same thing with uh, planning forward, uh, providing goals, providing a uh, to-do to list or a risk management, writing it down, just sitting down. A lot of it is common sense, but when we look back at some of the mistakes that we make as companies and as individuals, we go, wow, that was stupid. <laughs> Why did we let that happen? And oftentimes it was, it was because we didn't develop a plan or a list and assign who's responsible. And I'll talk about that here in just a minute to, for each of these risks. So that plan, again, every risk management plan should include three steps. And those three steps is you identify the risk, then you stop and you assess the risk, again, with the right people in the room. And then you come up with a plan to mitigate that risk. Can we transfer it? Can we reduce it? Can we get rid of it altogether? Again, as I said earlier, low, maybe green, we're good to go. Medium, it's time to slow down. And high risk, stop. Let's, let's stop think about it before we proceed forward. I like to use one page, simple colors. You can quickly look at the sheet and know what you, where you need to spend you know, most of your time. So I'm going to come back to this. Uh, you saw it earlier. Number one here, we talked about the sensitive electrical equipment, other equipment you know, during the vibration of uh, explosive filling, or even uh, using you know, 20,000 pound per foot hydraulic 
breakers to break up foundations. And then you understand what that risk is. Can we, we mitigate it? Can we come up with a plan? And I'll give you some examples that we did at the Georgia Dome as well as recently on, a, on another project here in a downtown area is we, we did some modeling. Uh, ideally, you have some good geotech in, information, but there is a way to determine what type of, 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 of vibration that you could encounter from explosive filling. U.S. Bureau of Mines allows three inches per second peak particle velocity, so you may need to determine what the sensitivity level is of, of that equipment and then kind of back into it and say, rather than just guess, is there a way to determine? Sure. So you assign somebody that risk. As you see here, it had my name over there as the owner risk manager. It was open because we hadn't completed the activity yet. And then we had some lessons learned. You notice there I have number four and 15. So this is something that we've encountered at least two times before, before we, we looked at it for this last project that we just completed a couple months ago. So again, you see how that's used. It's very easy, it's simple, it's a living document. And as you go down here and look at some of my examples, scope increase because of underground structures. Hey, if you've been in the demo business for five years, you know that that's a reality. Uh, that the drawings that you get, the information that you have, or even as an owner, as you're trying to find out what's there and needs to be removed, it's kind of hard to tell the contractor, remove everything and anything that they encounter without giving them some information to show what's there. So is that a risk? Most well, definitely in this situation, we had it green. Well, how could you have it green, Tim? Well, this project was only remove everything to slab on grade. <laughs> so we had no foundational risk. Uh, but again, if you look at the lessons learned, we had about five, six examples over there. The last one, and when I say last, this, this page is sheet one of, of, well, I don't want to make you nervous. This, on larger projects, I could have 60 to 70, 80 items on the risk register. On a larger project, on a smaller project, it could be a half dozen. So again, this could vary depending upon the project. But we all know that the, that small project can, can cause as many problems for us as the larger projects. So whether you're a small company or a large company or you have a few projects or many projects, it's a great tool for you, especially as a leader, to come in and just take a look at it from time to time and say, hey, where are we at? Again, this isn't an action analyst. It's not getting checked off and then it's done. It's a living document until the activity is actually completed. All right, lessons learned. I've talked about that a lot. We've gone ahead and you'll get a little more of this, how to develop a lessons learned and perform a root cause analysis in the, I think it's the project management module. I, I'll be leading that here in a few weeks for those who want to come back and join us for another hour. Uh, but again, when you encounter those problems in the past, as you see your lessons learned, you don't sweep them under the rug. It's the worst thing you can do. Uh, if you do, you're bound to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So the best thing to do, especially if it's a serious incident, and, and if it's a fatality or a, a serious lost time injury, I, I always encourage our, our owners, our contractors, not to touch it, obviously, until the statute of limitations is over. But once it is, and you can dissect it, you know, hopefully it's not a fatality uh, or a serious injury, because those are very hard to look at, and you have to really probably bring some people from the outside to, to look at it objectively. I know I had to. Uh, uh, you know, I couldn't think about the one that I had for several years. But whatever the situation is, uh, the worst thing you can do is sweep under the, the, the rug because it's going to happen again. So you capture it in a, in a, a lessons learned. Um, no name, no blame approach. So we're not trying to cast blame. Uh, we usually try to develop these in such a way where we're not calling out people. Now the reality is if it's something major, everybody knows anyways. So rather than let people provide misinformation on something that occurs, as a contractor, I can tell you, you can take a very bad situation and be forthright with your owner and say, yes, this happened and here's what we did to prevent its reoccurrence. And here is the uh, demonstration or the examples that it was effective. And that's what this report does. It allows you to take a bad situation. Somebody, um, maybe your competitors or somebody out there in the industry is pushing the corner and you can turn it to to benefit you and the organization and learn from it and grow as an organization. Uh, so again, I'm a huge proponent of developing lessons learned. I have probably well over 100 of lessons learned only because I've been in this industry 30 years. And if I started capturing these um, 20 years ago, I'd probably have 1,000. I've only been doing this the last decade. Um, so that's why I've only have, I only have them in the hundreds. But um, again, uh, these can be positive and negative. It doesn't always relate to an accident or an unplanned event. It could be a, a poor bit 
what, what did we learn about the bid? Or maybe a client or maybe a management issue. Um, there's certain things that you just need to capture and understand as a company. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel the next time you encounter that, that challenge. Again, we will go through this in the project management course if you choose to join us. So let's look at some real demolition uh, risk as we uh, wrap up the next five minutes. Um, all these projects uh, obviously have risks. Uh, on the left, you see the excavator um, knocking out the last column before the structure came over. Prior to the uh, last column, it was sitting right in front of that, knocking out the other three. Um, in the middle, what is that 200,000 pound excavator? Was it successful in pushing over that stack? Sure was, um, but what you didn't see was Prior to this, it created a bird mouth on the other side of that masonry stack before it pushed it over. To the right there, that's down in Cape Canaveral, Florida, there wasn't enough room to drop the whole tower, so they tripped it midway um, because there was a structure to the left that you can't see that they wanted to protect, which meant there were some guys up there cutting the guts out of that structure and tying cables to machines um, in the background so they could pull out the couple last couple legs. Are there risks associated with these approaches? Most definitely. If you, um, and, and I'm not going to say which one of these I would allow or discourage and uh, you from using, but I can definitely tell you some approaches in the demolition industry are higher risk and some are definitely lower. So again, at the end of the day, you might choose as a, as a demolition contractor, as an owner, and as an owner, you can prohibit just about anything. What you cannot do is direct a contractor's means and methods. So it really comes down to timing, evaluating your risk and you may be up front prohibiting certain things. But unfortunately, when that's occurred, I've seen situations where <laughs> owners, unfortunately, have prohibited the wrong thing. And I scratched my head, and sometimes I try to meet with them and say, hey, why, why, are, you, why are you prohibiting that? Because you're, you, you could be making the project uh, uh, more risky. So again, thinking about it, getting that trusted advisor as a demolition contractor, sitting down with your team and saying, you know what, it might cost us 2 or 3% more. Uh, but if we're able to reduce the, ris the, the risk by 30 to 50 percent, um, let's do it. And then, and then you're around for the long haul rather than having something happen and, and uh, you're out of business. So, you know, many people will look at different things and come up with different conclusions. As you look at this picture, some people see a, a man's face with a, a mustache and his nose, and other people see two little cottages with a shepherd in the, in the foreground. So... Again, it's all perception as you look at different things. We all have different perceptions based on our experience and understanding. But some people will see one thing and others will see another. So are there some best practices and, and tools to mitigate risk or, or help us see our blind spots? Most definitely. Maybe you've developed some standard operating procedures so that you can uh, go to that over when you're getting ready to do something, especially a high hazard activity site and scope specific work plans that you develop that you continue to, to improve upon with, with lessons learned from the past the next time. Maybe third party oversight. There, there may be a time as you as a contractor or as an owner that you're bringing in a structural engineer or a demolition expert or an or a, a, a environmental scientist to look at something that you're not an expert in. And the worst place to be is not to know enough what you don't know. And I see that all the time. People will just raise their hand and give themselves a title and, and they're off to the races. And unfortunately, the, the outcome is, is very predictable. And then that risk management plan, coming up with the plan, identifying it with the right people, understanding that, you, that there are risks associated with demolition abatement and all types of decommission projects. So as promised, I got one minute to spare. So Lindsay, I'm going to hand it back over to you for Q&A. And we're going to spend the next uh, 10, 15 minutes here answering your questions. Thank you. All right, Tim, thank you so much for your presentation. So <laughs> everybody, you can submit any questions that you have for our Q&A portion here by clicking the Q&A uh, tab on your control panel, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, go ahead and submit your questions there. You can also, you'll be able to see questions that other folks are submitting. And if you click the thumbs up button, that will upvote the questions that you most want to see answered. And as we're waiting for a couple questions to pop in here, I did want to follow up on something that Tim mentioned. We will be hosting more webinars in the coming weeks. So next week, we'll have the Solutions Foundations webinar on estimating. Um, that will be next Tuesday, April 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, so same exact time slot as today. And then in early May, we'll be rounding out the series with webinars on project management and job cost tracking. So make sure that you're on the lookout for registration emails from NDA for both of those, or for all three of those programs. 
All right, Lindsay, are the questions pouring in? We are still waiting to grab some questions. I know that you all have them. I'm sure they're burning. You're just <laughs> not quite able to type fast enough with your questions. Um, so Tim, as we're waiting for some questions to come in, would you like to share any additional thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I would. Now, obviously, um, there's a lot of things that are very sensitive, and I'm very sensitive with the information that I have um, from the industry. I, I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, obviously, um, in the NDA stands for National Demolition Association, but most often I see the NDA as a non-disclosure agreement. There is a great risk management tool. As an owner, uh, use, use NDAs. As, as a contractor, use non-disclosure Sometimes on, on very sensitive projects, unfortunately, where after there has been a fatality or an unplanned event, we may come in by uh, working with the owner's legal counsel. So there is that uh, ability to have that um, uh, attorney-client privilege uh, protection there on the exchanges of our information back and forth. So just, uh, again, there's many ways and things to think about. We are in a very um, risky business. And anyone who wants to say otherwise, I, I'll sit down with you and show you the statistics and compare us to other industries like crane operators and, and others. We, we're in a very risky business, but there is a way to mitigate that risk. There is no fear if, if you have a good plan and you have the right people and you approach it in, in a wise way and manner, uh, contractually, legally, technically, safety. There's just many aspects. Public relations is a case of mitigating risk. So hopefully that helps. Do we get any questions yet, Lindsay? We have not gotten any uh -oh. quite yet. Um, we do still have, you know, about 10, 10 more minutes if anyone would like to submit some questions. Yeah, it's, I, I see that nobody's dropped off. So I wonder if we're having any technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who joined us, it's anonymous. So we, we, we can't see uh, who's, who's online, nor can you see who else has joined. And that would be true in the, in the future moving forward. So if you don't have any questions yet, there's a couple other things I, I'd love to talk about, Lindsay, while we're waiting. Oh, I see a Q&A. Is there one? Yeah. Thing? Go ahead. Are the risk management tools that Tim uses available on the NDA website? Yeah, so most of them are, uh, but not all of them. Uh, we, risk management, um, if, if you come to the, to the one day class, we'll, we'll give you and walk you through the development of a risk register. We'll give you all through, I think in the project management course, how to develop the lessons learned. You'll have the basic, the basic tools and resources. So yes, we can provide them to you. However, um, this isn't something that we've developed from scratch. This is a, a process that actually most of my larger companies use. And it's a formal process and there's some software out there that you populate with your risk and it, some algorithms will will tell you how much um, uh, days you, you need to include for schedule delays, for schedule risk, as well as budget contingency. That's a, that's a full-blown Oracle Monte Carlo analysis, and not very few of my clients go that far, um, but you, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, again, I like the, the one page um, or multiple pages, but the same format. Uh, green, yellow, red, easy approach. That we can we can walk you through um, if you can if if you have an opportunity to join the course. I think if we sent you the information today on this this one hour, uh, it definitely would help. Um, but if you do get an opportunity to come back and spend a full day with us, I think it would, it would greatly benefit you. Lindsay, agreed. So um, Tim, we did get one question is in. Can you please explain some more about what you mean by controlling risks? Yeah, so controlling or managing risk, transferring, reducing risk. So you, you might have a risk that you cannot uh, get rid of, yeah, but you need to manage it. You need to control it. And so that, as maybe an owner, as a project manager, uh, as a demolition contractor, you, you stay on top of. You understand, hey, we're, we're, we're taking on this project. We have this risk that we're all aware of. Uh, we, we've added some additional cost for that risk and risk sometimes equals greater rewards when everything turns out as well as is planned, but sometimes they don't. And maybe it's a maybe it's a sinkhole that you need to backfill <laughs> and you're just guessing how much is uh, underneath there or you can quantify that risk. 
that, uh, yeah, we have this sinkhole from the previous uh, maybe demo contract or activity that didn't backfill the, the hole correctly or didn't cap the utility. And uh, you quantify that, manage that risk by, by letting the owner know we we anticipate it'll be up to 100 cubic yards. And if it exceeds it, we'll sit down to um, talk about the difference. Other ways with the scrap market, you may take a, a scrap sharing approach with your owners or owners with your contractors. Um, if you don't share in the, the upside and the downside of the risk, the contractors have to provide a contingency in their bids uh, for that market, for that unknown negative effect on them when the market goes down. So again, you can manage that risk by working together uh, in partnership with your contractors. I, I have a saying contractors and it's true i say we nobody gets thrown on the bus we all succeed or fell together at the end of the project we've all succeeded or fell together if one of us is the owner owners engineer contractor subcontractors gets thrown on the bus we've all lost because that means somebody got hurt that means we're over budget that means we're over schedule you know because we were not in compliance uh, with some regulatory requirement but again we have to be looking out for each other. We have to manage risk together. And uh, I've talked to some of our larger demolition contractors in the industry recently about their familiarity with risk registers. They said, yes, Tim, our owners are coming to us when we get started to help them populate their risk registers. So again, this is working its way down uh, through the industry. It was very new and foreign to me eight, nine, ten years ago. And now I'm starting to see it. Uh, more and more, which was the reason why I wanted to share it with the trade association. I felt like it would be a great tool uh, for the demolition industry. Great. I see some additional questions, Lindsay. Great. Yes. So our next question is, do you consider the expected monetary value of the risk to build your contingency on a project? Yeah, great question. So yeah, there, again, um, you, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's the, the old adage, what's fair? Well, what's fair at the end of the day is what one person's willing to offer and another is willing to accept. And so sometimes you might not be able to add a, a dollar value to contingencies that you have and still be competitive and win the project. So again, there's other things that you may need to, to look at. Um, I, you know, as a demolition contractor for 20 years before I started representing the owners as the owner's engineer last 10, there were many sleepless nights <laughs> whenever I provide. I was just as excited when I, as I was afraid, thinking, what did I miss on the bid? In the last 10 years, I haven't had that problem. But at the last 10 years, whereas I used to be involved in you know, a handful of projects, now I'm involved in dozens and dozens of projects in, in different demo contractors. So fortunately, the, the contractors and the owners that I get to work with are, are great. Um, and nobody's out there cutting corners or knowingly. Um, it's those things that we don't think about are the ones that uh, that end up biting us in the backside. What, what, what other questions do you have, Lindsay? Yeah, so what level of risk or risk factors do you take into account when working over or around water? Wow, that's a great question. Um, there's a ton of stuff I could talk about. I'll just touch, touch off on some of the some of the, 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 the big picture things. So when you, you show up to a demo project, let's say at the end of the, the day, you have to provide positive drainage for the site. Most of your specs will say that. And you don't know if you have a flat site, a crown site, or a dip site. But, so, but what helps you determine what you have is you look at the topography or the topo map, and it provides the elevations, and you can, with your civil engineer, understand how much soil Well, you're working underwater, and maybe you need to take piers or pilings or something to below the mud line. Well, you can't see it. <laughs> so you, you need to start asking questions. Was there a hydrographic survey? Is there any type of information that shows me um, how, um, you know, uh, where, where the, uh, how to define the scope? If I'm taking the, the pilings or the, the foundation down below the water and I can't see it, uh, how far do I need to go down? Do I need to go to the mud line? Do I need to go below the mud line? Well, what is that elevation? Have you provided, and again, just, the, the best time to work through these risks as a contractor is during that bidding phase where you have the opportunity to ask questions after you receive the RFP. And I would not uh, risk it. That is, a, <laughs> no pun intended, that is a great time to ask a lot of questions and level the playing field. Some people will say, well, I'll just make it up with the change order. Not necessarily. You might have something that you missed in the fine print that said you're responsible for any and all things encountered. Um, 
and uh, you might have an unrealistic uh, client you're working with, and then that may be a huge risk. The best thing to do is just be very forthright, get everything out on the table, ask the questions, and then once you have the information, you can then start to provide in your, your proposal, hey, we've got all this covered that we know of based upon the information that you provided to us. Is we can't we can't determine the extent of the scope of work because we can't see this underwater. Maybe there's a requirement for turbidity curtain to keep the uh, that's basically an underwater silt fence, by the way, to keep the silt from going out into the water. You know, there's just a number of questions that you need to ask. If you haven't worked over the water or next to the water before it's a demolition contract, I highly suggest you not to just jump into that for the first time without doing your homework and understanding the risk associated with it. There's additional insurance requirements or safety requirements that I could go on. We could have a, we could have a webinar on, on just that, that one question alone, Lindsay. So I just want to touch off on the, the high points, but definitely a great question. Next one. Yeah, our next question is, is there a benefit of having a dedicated safety professional on staff versus an owner or operations professional wearing a dual hat when it comes to risk management? Yeah, I, I love that question too because um, I, I yes I do this depending upon the size of the company, but the better organizations that I've worked for and the better projects and programs that I've been involved with, the the win is making everybody the safety professional, getting everybody to understand that their job safety is number one, and it's not just a saying or a slogan that's not worth the papers written on, but really owning it, understanding it. So. The safety professionals, and kind of like myself, at the end of the day, my job is, is really equipping others to go do their jobs. Um, I'm, I'm just the behind-the-scenes guy. I'm not the hero. I don't get patted on the back when things go well. But I'm the guy if people get on the phone and call when things don't go right. <laughs> so, but, but, but our jobs as leaders is really equipping. So if you, if you have the ability as a company to be a safety professional to equip your people, great. What I think is valuable is getting somebody that understands the industry, not just getting a, a professional. And, and I see it within my own company all the time. We'll, we'll get people that have managed a couple demolition projects and uh, we'll put them out there managing a demo project. And then I find out the only time, by the way, I get a call from our C-suite because something went wrong and they're saying, what happened over here? And I go, well, it's the first time I've heard about the project. You can't really give me the, uh, uh, you know, the responsibility without any authority. So if you let me know about it up front, um, we, we can talk about it. But again, just because we had a safety professional out there didn't mean that we were mitigating the risk because they didn't know what to look for. So safety professionals are excellent. They're great. But you need to spend some time developing your safety professionals so they understand the risks that are associated with the demolition industry. Good, good question. What else, Lindsay? All right, well, that does take us to the end of our questions, and we are nearly at the end of our hour. So, Tim, is there any final comments you'd like to share before we wrap up? Yeah, um, if you have continued questions, uh, myself and all the facilitators, we always provide our um, email addresses. Uh, it might not be timely. <laughs> I've got a, this is a, I have a day job. We volunteer our time to do this because we love it um, in the development of this, but um, it's tim.c.barker. That's Tim, C as in cat, dot C, dot Barker at AECOM, A-E-C-O-M dot com. So feel free to drop me an email if you have any additional questions or had a question that you didn't get answered today, and I'll, I'll try to answer it. Or, or feel free to call me, 678-264-7587 is the phone number, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you have. Thanks, Lindsay. All right. Thank you so much, Tim. So again, thank you for your entire presentation and answering our questions today. And thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. When you close out of the webinar, you are going to be redirected to a brief evaluation survey. It'll take about three minutes. If you take those three minutes and give us your thoughts about this program. Um, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, we don't do a lot of online webinar style education. We're going to have a series here for the next couple of weeks but we'd love your feedback on what other types of programs would be good in this virtual format. Um, if you do have any additional questions that maybe Tim isn't, maybe is, they're not content-based, your questions for NDA, please give us an email at education at demolitionassociation.com and we'll get you squared away as well. And we hope to see you at our next live uh, in-person course. The Foundations of Risk Management will be held in Chicago in September. So make sure you check out our website um, and get registered for that live course with us. Thanks again for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Lucy.